Desiree Reed Francois is leaving for Arizona, and I sure as heck did not see this coming, and there's really no positive way to spin this. This is a bad look for Mizzou, so let's talk about it coming up right now on Locked on Mizzou. You are Locked on Mizzou, your daily podcast on the Missouri Tigers, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, all you true sons and daughters, I'm John Miller, your Mizzou mafioso and the central scrutinizer of Missouri Tigers football and basketball. And well, I was going to lead this program talking about Sam Horn and his decision to get Tommy John surgery, but well, obviously those plans had to go into the dumpster fire. No question about that. And hey, if I got time, I'll talk a little bit about Missouri's latest loss in basketball as well, this time in Ole Miss. Also, I do want to quickly remind all of you that these days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. That's why LinkedIn Jobs helps find the right people for your team faster and for free. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. Terms and conditions apply. And indeed, some really stunning and, and to me sad news today. Desiree Reed Francois off to Arizona. Who the heck saw that one coming? It really came out of left field, at least for this podcaster, though I have to admit, over the last few hours or so, you start piecing together a little bits of information and it starts to make a little bit more sense. Clearly, there was some kind of power struggle that happened behind the scenes here at the University of Missouri, and I don't know who to blame for this necessarily, but my goodness, it just seems like this was the time if you're if you're behind the scenes at Missouri, hey, maybe there maybe you don't get along with everybody, whether it's your boss or my boss or your boss. Maybe maybe everything's not all kumbaya all the time. But I'll tell you this, when football is going as well as it went in 2023, setting up for a big 2024, yeah, basketball's been rough. I get it, but why not keep the train on the tracks? With millions of dollars flowing into the university and a favorable name, image, and likeness landscape. But no, apparently somebody did not have enough power. And, and maybe that person, to some extent, was Desiree Reed Francois herself. And in fact, that's almost certainly the case. I would say, because you know what, not to sound like Vladimir Putin here, but let's go back in time for a second, people. I, I'm joking there a little bit. Let's calm down. But seriously, if you go back to the off season, just after the 2022 season, this past off season, well, Eli Drinkwitz got a contract extension that was widely mocked by a whole bunch of people nationally and a lot of Missouri fans too, who understandably were saying, hey, this guy's basically a 500 coach. He's never had a winning season at Missouri. Does he need another contract extension? Well, you can kind of understand that sentiment and perhaps that's how Desiree Reed Francois felt because if you'll remember, well, Gabe DeArmond said it over at Power Mizzou, this was not a Desiree Reed Francois call, that first contract extension. No, this was a board of curators maneuver. And going all the way back to my podcast at the time, what I said is, hey, guys, this is the cost of doing business. I didn't have a lot of criticisms for the extension itself. What I did criticize is, wait a second, we've got a really good athletic director here, I think. And by the way, this was in the middle of two thumbs up for the Dennis Gates hire at that point too. So people were feeling good about Desiree Reed Francois at this point. I think when we woke up today, we were feeling pretty good about her as well. I know I was, I'll just speak for myself, but that was the first real sign of a bit of a schism there between the board of curators, perhaps others behind the scene and Desiree Reed Francois. Now fast forward to just about a week and a half ago on February 8th, the University of Missouri system announced that there was going to be some sort of oversight committee that was going to be basically overseeing the athletic department. Now again, the board of curators and Eli Drinkwitz, not only let's go even a little bit further back 
when Eli Drinkwitz was first hired, you may remember Jim Sterk wanted to hire Blake Anderson. And the board of curators said, eh, eh, that ain't good enough. Find somebody else. Well, when they came back with Eli Drinkwitz, for all intents and purposes, the board of curators hired Eli Drinkwitz to be your head coach at the University of Missouri. And that moment, well, that led pretty quickly after that to Jim Sterk getting the ax and Desiree Reed Francois replacing him. So long story short, 11 days ago, once again, there's some oversight committee that kind of comes out of seemingly nowhere that is going to be seemingly telling Desiree Reed Francois how to do her job. Now you might be saying, hey, your boss gets to tell you what to do and she should just sit there and take it. I don't know. Maybe she should have. But from my perspective, this woman has done a great job in her short time at the university, especially from a fan's perspective, the fan experience, the in arena and in Memorial Stadium experience has been improved, I'd say, tremendously over the past few seasons. I'm going to give her and her staff, the people she's hired, a tremendous amount of credit for that. So to me, to, for this to all get off the rails here, ultimately this is just a bad look for the University of Missouri because if you think about it, all right, on one hand, Desiree Reed Francois is just one person. A lot of people are saying that. It's just an athletic director. I could agree with that. I really could, except for the part that once again, this just feels like a Missouri Board of Athletic Directors, a behind-the-scenes bunch of people who are in academics, uh, presumably, or whatever it is, the point is you have to hire, you have to trust your athletic director, in my opinion, to make football hires, or else why would I want to be the athletic director at Missouri? Sure, the Tigers have a lot of advantages being in the SEC. They can certainly pay people a lot of money, but Desiree Reed francois reportedly is actually going to make slightly less money at Arizona than she would have made at Missouri under her contract. So it wasn't about money for her, and it certainly wasn't about a better situation. Even the Locked On Sooners host who made a joke about that, I said, oh, come on, what do, you, do you really think Arizona's a better job? He was saying, nah, I'm just trolling Missouri fans. And I said, hey, fair enough. I've certainly been guilty of that in the past as well. But, you know, the point is there's just no way to spin this as, oh, she wanted to leave for sure. I just don't think that's possible. Did she lose a power struggle here and possibly saw the writing on the wall and chose to leave? Yeah, that's possible. Certainly. That may likely have been what happened here. Or maybe behind the scenes, they said, hey, maybe it's time for you to look for a new job. I'm not really sure what happened there. Maybe we'll get some kind of indication one way or the other. But regardless, I think the obvious conclusion here is once again, Missouri has a board of directors, or excuse me, a board of curators problem. Who are these people? They're basically faceless and nameless in that none of us, none of us as fans know who they are. I'm sure we could go online and look them up, and I've seen their names out there on the internet. Heck, people have sent me their email addresses already after my emotional reaction on, on, on the, tw the old Twitter slash X app. But it is pretty bizarre that after all, through all this time, you've got a great athletic director, what is all the meddling for? What is the purpose of all this other than other people just trying to grab more power, grab more money, grab some some wins for their ego? Because I'm not just making this up out of whole cloth. Ben Fredrickson at STL Today, he says on his Twitter feed, he said there had been some low-key friction between Desiree Reed Francois and certain members of the MU Board of Curators. Lots of university, quote, oversight that suggested lack of a united front, but didn't think it was something that would lead to an immediate departure. So there you go. Again, that's it. Not having a united front. If you're in pro sports, if your coach and your general manager and your owner, if they're all fighting with each other instead of being on the same page, well, that's a really huge problem. And I think some people will try to convince themselves that, hey, maybe Desiree Reed Francois, maybe she was the problem. I'm sorry, I've seen I'm seeing a, a certain I'm seeing a lot of variables change over the years in the Missouri Department of Athletics. But one thing that never changes, maybe the members of the Board of Curators change. What doesn't change is they have way too much power. And if I'm a, an athletic director who's looking at the Missouri job, why would I want to deal with that? I'd rather go somewhere where I can actually pick my football coach. How about that? 
And coming up, Sam Horn has decided to get Tommy John surgery on his injured throwing elbow, and that puts Missouri in a pretty tough spot at the quarterback position, specifically for the backup spot in 24, but even for the future as well. So let's talk about that and a little more on the athletic directorship position as well. But first, let's talk about LinkedIn jobs, because when you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn jobs. LinkedIn jobs has the tools to help find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. And I'm just going to tell you from personal experience, when you find that right person, you cannot wait to give them money. They are value added. But just on the opposite side of the coin, you find the wrong person. Oh, man, it's going to cost you a heck of a lot more than what you're actually paying that person. But hey, here's the good news. Hi- hiring is easy, not speaking, but hiring is easy when you have that many quality candidates. So easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. So Sam Horn, of course, a Missouri pitcher and quarterback as well, is going to miss approximately the next 12 to 15 months after recovering from Tommy John surgery. Now, obviously, that's a really long recovery time, a standard recovery period from Tommy John surgery. Hey, Shohei Otani, similar deal, right? The famous pitcher now for the Los Angeles Dodgers. And the reason I bring him up is because, well, despite that Tommy John surgery, well, Otani still getting $700 bajillion or whatever it is that the Dodgers paid him this offseason. So obviously, Tommy John surgery does not mean the death of an athlete. And in fact, these days, the recovery rate is pretty good to the point where some Major League Baseball scouts almost would prefer that as a young person, you've already had the surgery just to sort of get it out of the way if you will. Now, we can argue about that, but the point is this is not a death sentence for Sam Horn's baseball career, and in fact, this is probably what what had to be done to save his baseball career at the end of the day. But this really could be a death blow to Sam Horn's football career. I I really believe that because, quite honestly, now that Horn is going to be out for this entire, not only this entire baseball season upcoming, of course, this will put next season's football season out without question. Spring football probably not happening either, so you're praying, hey, maybe Sam Horn is ready for fall football camp in 2025. But here's the thing. In 2025, Brady Cook could still be your starting quarterback. A lot of people are forgetting this, but yeah, just because Brady Cook played in 2020, let's not forget that 2020 season did not count for anyone. And if Cook, who at this moment, I don't think he's an NFL prospect, but he's certainly a good college player, you know, just money-wise, the new world of name, image, and likeness, just that alone, you'd think, hey, he'll have some pretty good offers to come back for that 2025 season. So long story short, what is the path here for Sam Horn, a guy who will now be three years, three seasons into his college football playing experience with basically no actual game experience whatsoever? I I just think he's almost too deep into his – he'll almost be too deep into his career for this to really work out well. It just – realistically, I'm just wondering how this is going to work out on the football field for Sam Horn. I think if I were him at this point, I'd probably just focus on baseball, focus on recovering because, honestly, at this point, while he was a really high-star, four-star, top-hundred-type player coming out of high school, you know – How many top 100 kids out of high school end up making the NFL? Not as many as you would think. So the point is, I just think his his I think his football career is in real jeopardy here. I just think that's the bottom line. And for Mizzou, obviously next season, well, that hurts at the backup quarterback position because Jake Garcia moved on. 
Jabari Johnson, a true freshman last season. Well, he thought Horn was going to be here and and Horn, or excuse me, Horn and Cook were both going to be here for the long term. Well, he moved on to Oregon State, could be a little closer to home as well. So if you're Missouri, now your only scholarship quarterbacks for this coming season are Brady Cook and true freshman Aiden Glover, who is enrolling early this spring. So the question is now, certainly Missouri's going to be going into the transfer portal for the third offseason in a row to get a quarterback. I don't think that's even in any way in doubt. But my question would be, do you go for a guy who's maybe a veteran type stopgap just to be an emergency backup player if Brady Cook gets hurt? Or do you go for a quarterback of the future? Now, naturally, in a perfect world, you'd get a guy who's both, right? Get a guy who's maybe a redshirt freshman that has talent to maybe be the guy in the future, but could also play a backup quarterback. But the point is here to me, it just all this is really complicated now because you're obviously past one of the portal parts. I'd say most of the quarterbacks have found a landing spot at this point. Probably the kind of guys you're going to get are going to be guys like Jake Garcia, maybe looking for another shot. But even Garcia was a guy who came to Missouri earlier than this. It's just it's hard to see Missouri getting a great option in the spring portal process. But hey, you never know who can be on the market. But at the same time, even if there are even if there are obvious guys, attractive guys on the market, I don't know that you'd want to necessarily go to Missouri either because you have an entrenched starter who, again, as I laid out, could very well be back as the starter for 2025 as well. So all of this has just made it kind of complicated for Missouri. And frankly, I'm kind of glad I'm not in Eli Drinkwitz's position to need to fill the quarterback right now because I don't know that you're going to be able to get both of those things this offseason. The the quarterback of the future and a backup, that's going to be really tough to pull off. Oh, and by the way, a new writer over at Rock M Nation, Nathan Hurst, who I've interacted with on Twitter quite a few times over the years, thought he had a really good piece on Sam Horn, just kind of really ultimately coming to the conclusion that I came to that, hey, this might be it for Horn when it comes to football. Well, Hurst in his piece, again, go check it out over at Rock M Nation. I thought it was really worth the time and read for sure. But he said some good context here. Just last week, Baseball America announced Horn as a top 30 collegiate prospect in the 2025 Major League Baseball draft. And if you look last year, I believe Hurst, had the the 30th collegiate prospect going off the board about 58th overall. And that was good for a million plus dollar type signing bonus. So again, more to the point, I just can't imagine that Horn is really any type of NFL prospect at this point, having completed a handful of passes so far here, what will be three years into his career at this point. So again, Good stuff there from Nathan Hurst and good good context there showing that, hey, if Horn's really a top 30 collegiate prospect, say he's top 60 prospect overall, if you include American high schoolers as well, I mean, that's just the dollars and cents don't really match up there. I mean, he's got to he's got to favor the baseball future at this point. I hope that he's not done with football. I really do. But he's got to protect his baseball value. It just wouldn't make any sense not to. And sitting winless at SEC play, Missouri basketball coach Dennis Gates decided to find a mirror, and in that mirror, he found the referees. So let's talk about Dennis's continuing battle with the officials coming up here in just a little bit. But first, I want to tell you about FanDuel because it's time to get buckets with your first bet on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150. If your team wins, bet on all your favorite NBA players and teams with, of course, player props, season season props, winning the NBA championship, conference and division winners, regular season win totals for the rest of the year, the whole deal. It's all there for you. You just got to visit FanDuel.com slash 
Locked on and shoot your shot. It's FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NBA. Locked on has launched the first ever national sports 24 7 streaming channel and YouTube, and now it's also available on Amazon Fire TV in the free Fire TV channels app. Again, find Locked on Sports today, now available on the free Fire TV channels app and Dennis Gates hey my whole crack about finding a mirror and he found the referees well I wasn't completely kidding ladies and gentlemen how did this quote how do these quotes go down for you asked about the game afterwards Dennis Gates said they scored when the clock was stopped on the free throw line in a half 20 minutes of play they shot 30 free throws So that's the difference, 30 free throws in 20 minutes. I mean, that's a free throw every 40 seconds. You can't defeat that. So I credit them for getting to the foul line. And then asked, well, what could Missouri do to maybe not put the other team at the foul line so much? Dennis Gates said, quote, I need to have a whistle and not call the fouls. That's what I think is the best remedy for it. They drew fouls. I can't predict that. That's a referee's discretion on what they think is a foul or not. Now listen, 30 free throws in the second half. That is pretty wild. I agree with that. But good Lord, man, I, I just enough with blaming the refs already. Your team is not good. Just own it at this point. And, and honestly, I don't care what Dennis Gates says. There is nothing that he's going to say that's going to satisfy fans at this point. But this isn't it. And to be honest with you, even the 30 fouls things a little or 30 free throws thing is a little misleading. Eight of those free throws were shot when Missouri was intentionally fouling to extend the game at the end. So and also, by the way, you look at the, the box score and you realize, wait a second, Missouri ended up shooting just as many free throws at the end of the game as Ole Miss did. Missouri was 25 for 30. Ole Miss was 22 for 30. So the exact same amount of free throws were shot. Again, if he's just trying to play through the media and get his guys some some better official, some better calls from the officials, if he thinks that's going to be an effective psychological strategy, well, then good luck to him, I guess. That's fine. But I'm just telling you, from a fan's perspective, boy, that stuff just starts to really really get a little bit old when when you're when you haven't won a game the entire season in conference play and you're blaming the refs on a regular basis it's just not a good look even if you have a point on some level I'm sure some nights obviously some nights Missouri's going to get the benefit of bad the the disbenefit I guess of, of bad officiating it happens there's bad officiating college basketball all the time. I've certainly had my much bigger complaints, but just focusing on just acting like, oh, Missouri, we just can't get a break with the officiating. Hey, that can maybe happen every game or two. It can't be can't be the excuse when, you know, you're 0 and 12 in the conference at this point. That 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 just does not fly for me whatsoever. The sad thing is, in a lot of ways, Missouri actually played a decent ball game against Ole Miss Saturday night, and, and I was into the game in the, se- in, in the second half, much more certainly than I had been in, in recent, since Sean Easton went down, there wasn't much to get excited about, but obviously with East back, well, he helped get that Missouri offense going again. He knocked down all 12 of his free throws, by the way. But certainly, man, what a bad break it was, by the way, when Missouri gets an off-the-ball foul. Called their way, by the way, but it took a three-pointer off the board. If that shot would have counted, we could have potentially gotten five points out of it, and Missouri gets, I don't know, zero or one out of it, I believe. So that was a terrible break there for Missouri in a season where you're going, man, can we just get a little lucky and get a victory one time? But I will say I thought... Probably the best game I've seen from Jordan Butler, maybe all season, certainly in a while. And I thought Aiden Shaw may have played his best overall game, too. Noticed over the last few games, Shaw has started to actually get a little more aggressive offensively, actually willing to shoot the ball at least around the basket, which is which is good news. At the very least, there's absolutely no reason whatsoever that Aiden Shaw shouldn't be willing to shoot the ball from close distance. In fact, I As I've said before, I saw Shaw a little bit in high school, enough to know that 
he was a skilled offensive player, much more skilled than he's shown this season with his basic unwillingness to even look at a jump shot this season. That's been it's been a real black mark, I think, against Gates this season. Not only just obviously we struck out in the transfer portal this offseason, but to me, almost even more alarmingly, is the fact that Aiden Shaw's offensive game that I expected to be pretty improved this season. Well, unfortunately, he's regressed. So hopefully the last few games here, especially this last game against Ole Miss, hopefully that's a sign that maybe Shaw's coming out of his shell offensively a little bit. And and by the way, just as a quick note, you may may remember Jamarion Sharp, seven foot five kid from Western Kentucky that Missouri was recruiting when Dennis Gates first got here. A lot of people thought Sharp, the nation's leading shot blocker at one point in his career, was going to come to Missouri. Well, he did not, obviously. Ended up going back to Western Kentucky. Now he's at Ole Miss with Chris Beard. Only played six minutes in the ball game against Missouri yesterday. Had what? Did he even get in the box score? He did have one block shot to go along with two personal fouls in six minutes. So not a lot happening there for Jamarian Sharp. Perhaps Missouri didn't really miss out that much in the portal for that particular young man either. And certainly Sharp would have, I don't know, how would he have fit in that Missouri team last season that was run and gun, get up and down the court? I just think he would have been a very awkward fit at best and maybe at worst would have kind of messed up the the team last year quite honestly so I don't know bullet dodged in my opinion so anyway thanks as always for listening to Locked on Mizzou and thanks for being a little bit patient with me I know the show came out a little bit later than usual today frankly I was uh I was broadsided completely by the Desiree Reed Francois news that threw off my schedule a little bit but hey better late than never Hope you enjoyed. Thanks for telling a friend. And until next time, I'm John Miller. This has been Locked on Mizzou.